Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. All right, today I welcome on the show, Mark Willis. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks, Jacob. Hey, absolutely. It's our pleasure. Well, Mark, could you share a little bit about your background and your expertise with the audience? Yeah, sure. I'm a certified financial planner uh, and uh, work with clients around the country. Uh, I own a financial firm here in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and, uh, you know, we work with clients, a uh, tr- tremendous amount of those clients are real estate investors of all types, uh, all shapes and sizes, you know, from a few doors to several thousand in their portfolio. Uh, and we work specifically with people who want to grow their wealth uh, right alongside their real estate portfolio in ways that are liquid. Uh, you know, that give them tremendous amounts of flexibility and downturns. And, uh, you know, it sort of helps them become what we call anti-fragile real estate investors. Uh, So I'm uh, proud to be on here with you. It's a tremendous honor. Yeah, Mark, well, uh, you're really speaking our lingo here. And uh, yeah, you're right. Many of our audience members are here for, you know, the real estate investing aspect of things. You know, many people's goals are to build wealth and achieve financial freedom through cash flowing real estate. So, you know, when you think about uh, someone, you know, like a a certified financial planner like yourself, Mark, and associated with a financial services firm, you don't always think about, you know, uh, folks like you, CFPs that are uh, promoting real estate products. So, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what exactly is wrong in today's traditional financial planning and the financial advice that's out there? Absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, you're correct there, Jacob. The, the, the vast majority of financial advice I'm hearing is even from certified financial planners, which are kind of the gold standard for, you know, giving uh, uh, advice and feedback to millions of Americans, uh, you know, across the country. Uh, and unfortunately, even as I went through my CFP, I realized how narrow the, the focus was. It's a tremendously um, in-depth uh, designation. You really go from everything from estate planning through taxes, through investments, insurance, and, and the whole gamut. But what I found was uh, the the absolute overwhelming majority of your focus is on uh, paper investments, uh, mainly on um, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and the like. Uh, that is seen as the primary tool for growing and accumulating wealth. But here's the interesting thing, Jacob. Anytime we looked at the major affluent markets, anytime we were doing like tremendously complex estate plan uh, case studies and so forth, uh, I noticed that real estate and uh, yeah, real estate investing was one of the tremendous uh, and specific ways in which the, the ultra high net worth clients were passing on their wealth. And that got me really thinking, well, you know, you know, why is it we're focusing our current day clients on things like Wall Street, uh, whereas folks that already built the wealth seem to have it all in a different asset class and inside real estate. So that's a, that's what started my, my mind spinning a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting, Mark. So you're looking at all of uh, your clients case studies, if you will, and realizing that much of their wealth creation has not been through these traditional routes of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but rather real estate investing. And on the flip side of that, that's really what you're, you know, most certified financial planners are promoting are these traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things like that. So can you tell us kind of how you turn that corner mentally and, you know, starting to look at real estate as a, as a legitimate asset class for your clients to build wealth and achieve financial freedom with? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so after leaving the CFP studies, I got into the real world and began working with real clients. And and that was my experience. The, The true financially thriving uh, in my client base were real estate investors. And, you know, what they had done was very different from what were really all of us taught. You know, most of us are taught to diversify, 
you know, diversify. That's the, that's almost like a truism uh, in financial planning. Get, get a, you know, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, let's spread, spread it all out among a couple of mutual funds. Yeah, Mark, you're so right. In today's society, people are taught to diversify, diversify, diversify. And like you said, it's almost a truism you're receiving from your financial advisor, financial planner, or whoever you're getting your advice from. And it's like, if you're not diversifying, you're almost taking on unnecessary risk. So what's your thought behind all of that? Well, you know, I get it. I see that point. And you're right. You don't want to just put all your eggs in one basket. But on the other side of the coin, Jacob, if all your eggs are in 12 different baskets, but they're all on the same truck and the truck goes over a cliff, <laughs> right? What good was that, right? It doesn't make much difference. Uh, what we need is non-correlated assets. That's the big fancy term, but the, the, you know, to use the metaphor, we want our eggs on multiple trucks so that if one goes over a, tr uh, a cliff, we've got other eggs safe, and, safe as can be. You know, uh, one of the things that I've really was dumbfounded by was how inefficient paper wealth is at creating true financial freedom. Here's what I mean. Um, there are really only three ways over the last several thousand years that people have truly earned financial wealth. And the three ways are real estate, business ownership, and paper wealth. Guess what? The, the least efficient one, paper wealth, is what we're really pushing most financial advisors are really pushing today. You know, 401ks, IRAs, brokerage accounts, um, savings accounts, all of that is simply paper wealth that could vaporize tomorrow, especially anything that's tied to a market that could be up one day and down the next. Uh, we really are out of control when our money is on something that we can't control. Uh, and I'll just say one more thing. It's also tremendously inefficient to get an income from a 401k. Uh, I'll tell you recently, uh, um, Morningstar, which is a third party independent research firm, does a lot of work on mutual funds and so forth. They recently uh, issued a, a report, uh, had a number of PhDs in economics and personal finance. One of them was one of my professors at the American College. Uh, they, they discovered that the 4% rule is dead. Now, some people were like, I didn't even know there was a 4% rule, but most financial planners know what the 4% rule is. Um, so Jacob, just for your listeners, if, if they're not aware, the 4% rule is you take whatever you've been able to save in your 401k or IRAs, and you multiply that by 4%, and that's the safe withdrawal rate that you could pull out of a 401k or IRA. So if you got a million bucks in your 401k, mm -hmm. uh, you could safely withdraw about 40 grand okay. a year. Uh, that was the 4% rule. Uh, that has now died. <laughs> uh, so the new rule is to have a 90% success rate. Now, all right, so 4% rule only has a 50% success rate. That means one in two of us will run out of money and have to go to work at Walmart uh, if we pull even just 4% of our money out each year. I mean, that's tremendously inefficient already. But now the, the new withdrawal rates, according to this report, uh, again, you know, we're talking about uh, the heads of research of multiple universities and Morningstar is closer to 2.8%, 2.8% withdrawal rates. So you take your million dollars, you get 2.8% of that, that's $28,000 a year. And that's taxable money if it's in a 401k. So Jacob, now we're uh, looking at yeah. <laughs> closer to $19,000 a year. That's the millionaire lifestyle. <laughs> if we're talking paper wealth, you see how inefficient that is? Oh, it's terribly inefficient, Mark. And you know, this million dollars is almost a benchmark that many people shoot for, but not even everybody achieves that by retiring with a million dollars in their retirement account. So oh, what you're course, saying yeah. is this is nowhere even near adequate to sustain what most people consider a comfortable lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the average 401k balance for folks who are 55 years old is only $70,000, according to the Department of Labor. So we're vastly underprepared. It's a retirement crisis. And that's an understatement. Uh, so my belief is let's find brand new ways of uh, reaching the goal. It's going to take all hands on deck. Uh, you know, so uh, real estate absolutely has an important part to play in the overall financial portfolio of one's life. Yeah, right. Well, Mark, going back to the three categories you mentioned, real estate, businesses, and paper assets, all three of these have the ability to create wealth for you, but none like the ability of real estate to create sustained cash flow in the near term. So could you talk to a little bit about that and the importance of building this cash flow before your retirement years? 
before retirement yeah, before years? Before your retirement course. years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it certainly we, I think we can all understand how it helps after retirement, uh, during your retirement years. Uh, but even before that, you've got a, a steady stream of income that you can use for just about anything you want to help supplement your current lifestyle, you know, uh, or save in for your future. Maybe that rent is even helping pay down the mortgage on your properties. And that gives you some, you know, tremendous equity you can then sell someday. The trouble is, even real estate has its, its, its shortcomings. And we can talk about that if you'd like uh, in some of the ways that our clients have uh, been able to overcome those shortcomings. Uh, but, you know, in, in general, the, the basic notion is letting, letting income flow to you is always better than flowing away from you. Yeah. Well, Mark, I'd be certainly keen on your input on real estate shortcomings. Obviously, we're on a real estate investing podcast here, but I think it's very important to hear counter arguments and understand the full spectrum of pros and cons of every asset class. So could we get your opinion on some of the shortcomings of real estate investing? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if this metaphor will completely help us here, <laughs> okay. but you know, if, if, uh, if a road is going to help us get to where we need to go, and there's a couple of potholes, you know, those are the shortcomings. We can fill in the potholes as long as we know where they are and how to fill them to help us get to where we want to go. So I believe that real estate is a tremendous road for us to, to ride on. We just need to know where the, the cracks, the crevices, the potholes are, the obstacles are, the speed bumps are, so we can manage them and even use them to our advantage. Again, uh, there's two kinds of investors. Uh, there's uh, the fragile investor that's always worried about the next market crash. And there's the anti-fragile investor who actually takes advantage of the next market crash and sees it as everything's going on sale. Let's buy, buy, buy. Right. That's how the most affluent among us took advantage of the great depression, the great recession. There was tremendous wealth created in 2008 and nine. Uh, it's just not seen from the average American's perspective because we were all unfortunately hoodwinked and upside down our mortgages. And when the tide came out, as Warren Buffett says, we all learned who was wearing pants and who wasn't. <laughs> yeah. so, so let's think about it for a minute. Um, how we get into real estate matters. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of real estate specialists say that the, the profit is made in the buying, right? Uh, so how do you get access to capital to buy your real estate? I mean, obviously the benefits of real estate are clear. You get that stream of income from your rental units. You get some nice security. These properties aren't going to go wildly fluctuate like the stock market will. Uh, you can even live in a two flat, you know, and rent out the bottom floor. It's an incredible tax shelter. You know, capital gains rates are often deferred, right? Um, but, you know, I've learned uh, in my research that on average, according to Case Schiller, we're only looking at 1% per year ab above inflation uh, in terms of real asset appreciation on real estate. Uh, so, you know, that's maybe 4% a year. Uh, of growth, if your property is growing at 4% a year, that's only a little bit better than inflation itself. Uh, plus we've got non-paying tenants, we've got the, the water heater that's blowing, the property taxes. You know, an investment is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. Until then, even real estate is a paper profit. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you're very right there. You know, there are a lot of risks associated with investing in real estate. Like you mentioned, those you know, unexpected water heaters, you know, leaking yeah. or in disrepair or, you know, your tenants skipping out or, you know, just even having a common vacancy. Yeah, those are all certainly financial risks us as real estate investors take. So like you said, just understanding those potholes in the road and being aware of yeah. those and almost preparing for them will help mitigate those risks. You bet. And, and the, a lot of folks think, well, if I can just get rid of my mortgage, all my problems will go away. The trouble is even that has some potholes associated with it. You know, mortgage payments don't earn any interest on your dollar, zero interest uh, investment. The equity is not liquid. Once I pay my mortgage off, I have to beg a bank to get my money. It's not like I got a bunch of dollar bills in my drywall. You know, I got to ask a bank to get the money out or sell the property. And of course, that equity is not guaranteed. Yeah, right. So a couple of points like, that I'd like to elaborate on here is what you're yeah. referring to is the rate of return on equity is actually zero. That is when you pay the yeah. bank back your mortgage, if you ever want that money back, i.e. your equity, you'd have to go back and borrow it from them on their terms, pay to borrow it again right. and all those things. So we're really preaching the power of leverage here. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly right. Yes. And I want to come back to that idea of leverage here in just a minute. But yeah, uh, you know, it's important also to remember we've got one of the best tax advantages in the entire tax code with our mortgage. And by getting rid of it, we lose that interest deduction uh, as we pay down the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, so there's tremendous reasons to stay in debt to a bank. I know that sounds crazy for a CFP to say, but uh, you know, there's actually some benefits that it's built right into um, the contract with the bank. Uh, that said, I'm a big believer in becoming free from the banking system. I believe that banks have, have it in for us. I think that they make the profit while us invest, real estate investors have all the risk. I mean, you think about it here, Jacob, um, they do all their underwriting on us before we're even approved for a loan. How much risk do they take versus us as real estate investors when, when we get a mortgage? Oh, Mark, you're preaching to the choir here. You know, I'm going through a current acquisition right now, and I feel like they know more about me now than I knew about myself prior to submitting my application for this newest loan. So, yeah, you're so right here. I mean, they really dig into your background. They have a snapshot, not not just a snapshot, but a complete picture of your financial well-being and, and, you know, just so many things. So, yeah, you're right. They are mm. doing their due diligence, certainly on you. Yeah. So, you know, they've, they've got it figured out and, and they're getting a cash flow just like, you know, we hope to get one from our tenants. But the good news is uh, for the bank that they can come after us and repo the asset. We couldn't do that with a tenant if they just, you know, up and left on us. You know, the, the mortgage, I mean, really, if we want to truly become uh, uh, sophisticated real estate investors, we should all just open up a bank and be the mortgage to everybody else, right? That's just yeah, no more water heaters to deal with. We just collect the mortgage payment. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's certainly one aspect to think of. Well, Mark, as a certified financial planner, you have some unique real estate investing advice that you provide to your clients. And one of those is along this topic that we're beginning to discuss here, and that is how to fire your banker and become your source of capital. Now, this is a really interesting topic and I'd like to understand your thoughts behind that. Yeah, um, and that, I'd love to chat about that. So, you know, becoming your own banker, firing your mortgage company and becoming your own source of financing, I think provides some interesting insights. But, you know, one of the things I like to do with my clients when I sit down with them before we jump to any conclusions is I really wanna hear from them, what do they, what do they really want? What do they want their money to do for them? Uh, I mean, Jacob, if you think about it, where you put your money makes it do different things. It's, it seems obvious, right? But I mean, a hedge fund is different than a savings account. Yeah, right. Very right? much so. Um, real estate's different than a checking account or a, a brokerage account. So, you know, what do we want? What, what would we want our money to do for us? If we could wave a magic wand, maybe I'll just, maybe we'll have a little fun here. Jacob, I'd love to know your thoughts on this. If you could create, you know, wave a magic wand, you know, uh, and so forth, create for a moment, you're the Pope of money, you get to des design your perfect financial investment. What are some characteristics or attributes you'd like your perfect financial instrument to have without any labels on it, without putting names to, you know, uh, financial products, what would you want your money to do for you if you had unlimited uh, creativity here. Well, Mark, I've got a lot of hobbies and many of those hobbies don't associate with going to work every day, but those hobbies are kind of expensive. So I need some cash flow in the near term. I need something to pay me every day so I can, you know, fund my lifestyle and, you know, still live. So, you know, that, Love that it. passive cash flow would be really important to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've got a long life, hopefully ahead to live. So, you know, I need some wealth in the future. So I need that security in the future as well. So I'd say cash flow in the near term, wealth in the future. Love it. Anything else? Mm, you know, I want stability. I want to take as little risk as possible. So those are a couple things that are important to me in terms of qualities. But I would say that's probably a pretty good picture of what I would like for my cash cool. flow and financial picture to look like. How about taxes? Any preference on, on those? Yeah, I'd like to not pay any taxes, Mark. <laughs> None at all. <laughs> Is that possible? I got to... I got some great real estate in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> okay, okay. No, that's, that, uh, this is a question I ask, and I typically go for 15, 20 minutes with my clients. I really dig, I really ask, because really, to be honest, before we jump into, hey, you should check out this mutual fund, or hey, you should you know, put your money in some annuity, or you should put, put your money over here in this thing, I want to hear from them, what do they want their money to do for them? And this is a great thought exercise for our audience, is to really think about that. What do you want your money to truly do? And then we'll start talking about products and strategies and concepts because there's over 450 
as far as I could count in my CFP studies, there's over 450 financial products out there, real estate being one of them. All right, so, and then we can combine those with different things. Like you can combine a trust and real estate to do a real estate investment trust or REITs. Mm -hmm. You can do, um, you know, hedge funds and real estate. I mean, all these things can multiply your options for where you put your money till it's almost overwhelming to how, you know, to where you should put your money. So, you know, some of the things that I put on my list, Jacob, I, I want easy access to that cash. You know, I don't want to wait six months to get my money from some bank or thir 30 days or whatever. I need liquid access for emergencies, opportunities. I want something that you said, like I want it to be third party rated. I want it to be safe. I want someone to tell me that wherever my money is, that it's actually there, that it's not some Enron scheme, right? Uh, I want it to be stable. I want as little risk as possible, like you said. I want guarantees that it's gonna grow every single year. I want something that's gonna be tax deferred, you know, like a CD at a bank. They tax you on that CD every single year, even though it's trapped in the bank. They're sending you that 1099 right. on your interest. Every it, I think that's ludicrous, but, and then I want tax-free access to it too. Uh, so I'm with you, man. If, if this is still legal, I want it to be tax-free. I don't want any contribution limits. You know, one of the, one of my favorite places to put cash is the Roth IRA, but the trouble with Roth IRAs is that you're forced to only put in 5,500 bucks, you know, 6,500 if you're over 50 years old. So, I mean, is that really going to solve our retirement crisis? Putting away five grand a year? Yeah, probably not. No way. I want it to be available for me. I want it to be available for my heirs. I want it to be a private transaction. I don't want any kind of, you know, public record of this if I can help it. So creditors, if I go through a bankruptcy, I don't want them to attach themselves to where my money lives. I mean, these are all things that I'm very interested in. I think real estate solves a lot of these, but it also falls short on others. But here's what I've found, and here's how you could become your own banker. You know, when you combine the benefits of what we just talked about with real estate, I think you can become even more dynamic and more competitive as a real estate investor. Uh, so that big list I just gave you, uh, you know, again, does something like that actually exist? And the good news is, yes, it does. And for a lot of our clients, we've used a strategy uh, that's grown every single year without fail, guaranteed for 160 years. Uh, and for certain clients, it makes perfect sense. We're using an old fashioned form of dividend paying whole life insurance of all things that fits everything I just listed in that, that little characteristic list. Now I didn't get into CF, to be in a CFP thinking that whole life insurance is a great place to stash cash. But the more I looked at it, Jacob, and this was my big wake up call, it couples so well with real estate investing. It's almost like two ends of a barbell. You know, it's almost like they, uh, like nitro and glycerin, they almost work better together than they do separate. Uh, so any questions on that oh, so far? Oh yeah, so many questions, Mark. Well, one, all those qualities you ran through. Yeah, everybody wants all of these, all of those long list of qualities. And you might think that there's no way one asset class can provide all of those. And like you mentioned, real estate checks a lot of those boxes, but maybe not all of them. You know, sometimes it's a little bit illiquid. It's hard to go sell your house to, you know, go buy the groceries for that day. So yeah, maybe it doesn't check a few of those boxes. Now, could you kind of dig in a little deeper on this whole life insurance and how it couples well with real estate? That's kind of a new term to probably many of the audience members and myself included. So it would be really interested yeah. in hearing your thoughts on that. Well, I'll, I'll say up front, most whole life insurance is not designed for cash accumulation. Uh, it's designed for simply to leave a death benefit to your family. Uh, and that's where most of my training was spent, was looking at how terrible whole life is for, <laughs> for your money. Uh, but what I started to realize was there's a, you know, sort of a slice of investments uh, and whole life insurance products out there that are really designed to increase your cash equity in the whole life contract. So let me back into this for a minute. There's two kinds of life insurance. There's the kind you rent and the kind you own. The kind you rent is what we're mostly familiar with. Term insurance, you rent it for a certain period of time until the landlord raised the rates, right? The insurance company will raise the premium on you the older you get. There's no equity in term insurance. You simply borrow and rent that death benefit, hope you never need it, right? And then at the end of the day, at the end of the term, the end of the lease, the landlord could kick you out. That's term insurance. Make sense so yes. far? So whole life insurance is owning that policy. You have a uh, asset known as the death benefit that's increasing in value and the cash equity is the stuff you can spend while you're still alive. So 
you own, kind of like you can uh, access your equity in your house, you can access the equity in this life insurance for any reason you choose. And it's guaranteed to grow every single year. In fact, it's increased in value for uh, 160 years guaranteed, guaranteed by the insurance company. So it gives you better rates of return than other cash equivalents, all right? So it's way better than you know, the CD or the money market accounts that most of us investors, real estate investors keep our cash in. You get easy access to cash for investments. Usually you can get your equity out of your whole life insurance in about three to five business days. So it's very liquid. Uh, of course it is life insurance, so it's an estate liquidator. One day all of us are gonna you know, graduate to the other side and if we've done well as real estate investors, we're going to have a ton of real estate and estate tax to pay, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yes. Right? So that's exactly what life insurance use, is used for with the ultra high net worth clients we have. You know, they use their life insurance death benefit to pay the estate taxes so they can keep the properties, the real estate properties in their family's, uh, family's foundation or name. Yeah, well, that's really interesting, Mark, and not something that's very well common knowledge out there. You know, another one of these things that are not exactly taught to your everyday investors. So, yeah, really interesting so far. Right. And one last thing, and I think this is mostly uh, as it relates to becoming your own banker, you can use this policy to become your own source of financing. So let's get mortgage companies out of our investment portfolio. Let's get them out of the business of pulling down our yield on our properties. You know, if we're making 8%, but we're paying 4% to a bank, net tax, that's actually maybe just breaking even. Right. Uh, you know, when you consider that the other chunk of that return is going to Uncle Sam. So this is not your father's life insurance. You know, it's modernized for massive cash value accumulation. You know, we're looking at mutual companies where you own the profits of the, of the insurance company. The gains are locked in, they're predictable. I'm a huge fan of this as a part of a well-balanced portfolio with real estate uh, on the other side. So it's, again, sort of like a barbell where you got your, your war chest of capital in your life insurance cash value. Again, that's the money you can grab whenever you need it for any reason. And then you're using that capital, that cash, to deploy whenever you find a great deal on real estate down the street. Yeah. Well, Mark, many of the audience members out there, maybe some of the younger generation are thinking, well, I have health insurance. I have dental. I have vision insurance. I might even have a life insurance policy, but they may not be thinking about this whole life insurance term or sorry, this whole life insurance policy. When and where is it you know, a good idea for someone to start thinking about this? If you need a good place to stash cash, if you want a warehouse of wealth, if you think you might ever need money someday, you might consider whole life insurance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I still tongue in cheek, but I'll tell you the truth. Again, most whole life insurance I would stay away from. You really need several things to be in place, engineered, sort of like, you know, I mean, there's Model Ts. I guess you could drive a Model T if you really wanted to, but, uh, and it's a car technically, but you know, the more modern vehicles that are created these days are much more efficient and get you where you want to go in a much more comfortable way than the old school uh, automobiles of a hundred years ago. This, these policies are exactly the same way. How you design the policy or how the advisor designs the policy uh, matters tremendously. Uh, in particular, you need an advisor, an educated advisor on the concept of becoming your own banker or bank on yourself as it's called. Uh, specifically who's willing to cut his or her commissions by about 70%. And that's, you know, when you draw back the curtain, you realize the reason why whole life insurance typically is so inefficient is because the advisor is getting a big fat commission on that premium that you pay to whole life insurance. Uh, whereas these type of policies, we call them bank on yourself policies, you're getting a uh, tremendously larger amount of cash value and the advisor is getting a pretty sizable pay cut to, to design the policy correctly. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mark, one question I have about these whole life insurance policies is, is this something you pay into monthly until you pass away? No, you can, you can, if you want to, but uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, you design this with the advisor that you work with and maybe that is a, one-time lump sum contribution. Maybe it's paid in annually. Maybe it is paid monthly for 10 years or 15 years or seven years, or, you know, you call them up 20 years from now and you say, this has been amazing, but uh, we're moving to Africa and we never plan to put money into this ever again. And then it's just going to sit there and grow for the rest of the client's life. 
Okay. And when can you make a deduction from this, Mark? Uh, so I'll tell you a quick story. Last year, uh, we had a client who sold a condo here in Chicago, and she walked away with about $150,000 of net profit. And she used that money to put into a brand new whole life insurance policy all at once. So it was a large contribution. So we're talking about a, a new mindset here where you're pumping in as much as you comfortably can into a life insurance policy. Now that money went in and about a week later, she called me up and said, I'd like to take a, an, uh, as much as I can out. So she took as much of that $150,000 out as she could. And she put, she bought another condo with that money. Okay. So within a week is the short answer to your question. Now, why would that be a benefit? Why wouldn't she just pay cash for the condo, the new condo? Yeah, right? that's a good question. <laughs> uh, and to answer that question, I want to try to walk through something very quickly. So, you know, when I have $150,000 in a savings account, let's say it's earning a, a generous 1% a year. <laughs> very generous. <laughs> All right. So now let's say we remove that, right? We, so we withdraw all that money out of the savings account. How much interest are we now earning on that cash that we withdrew? None. Correct. Yeah. And we, we broke in compound growth, which is like the, the, the most incredible thing to a financial advisor is un, uninterrupted compound growth. And we just broke it when we withdrew that money out. Right. So, and one of the key ways that this whole life strategy fits with real estate is this. When I put money into a whole life policy, if it's a non-direct recognition life insurance loan, that's a mouthful. But if it's a non-direct recognition loan from a mutual life insurance company, the policy will continue to grow even on that capital I borrowed against as if I had not touched a dime of it. So this client of ours last year when she pu pulled out the money from the policy to pay cash for the condo, her policy was still earning interest and dividends even on the capital she had borrowed out. Her money was doing two things at once in essence. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a really interesting point. And it's, it sounds complex on the surface, but once you dive into it, it's, you know, actually got some pretty practical uses and reasons why. And, you know, it's pretty easy to see how it can benefit both real estate investors and non real estate investors alike. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It really comes down to, um, how easy does this whole thing work? You know, kind of like our smartphones, there's a lot of complexity there, but for the user, it's simply, I push this button and it takes a photo or it checks my email. Well, Mark, so. you're on fire with the analogies today. I have to say from, <laughs> from the uh, truck to the road, to the iPhone, all really, really breaking it down and making it easy to understand. So, so far, great job with that. <laughs> thanks. thanks. Well, you know, I, I, I work so much with, with folks that want to see things in the real world. And I, I really believe in, this doesn't have to be complex. You know, we don't have to be stock jockeys. We don't have to be experts in the future because who really is? Let's be honest. Even financial planners don't know what's coming around the corner next Tuesday in the markets. Uh, what I know is what I can control, what I can see and what I can understand. Uh, so that's why I love real estate as a part of a financial investment portfolio. It, you know, it's, it's real doors. It's, it's real windows. You know, it's a real return on investment. And these whole life policies, I feel, sit so well, like again, I say nitro and glycerin, they sit so well to basically be your own line of credit, your own capital source for yourself. You know, if you got 200 grand sitting in your life insurance policy uh, and the market takes a nosedive, you know, doesn't that make you more competitive in the real estate space to purchase whatever deal you want? If banks aren't lending and, you know, let's be honest, the next recession will happen someday, who knows when, but the next time that happens and banks cut lines of credit, um, don't allow us investors to, to get access to capital, who are the ones that are going to be taking advantage of, of that space whenever, when all the real estate deals are on sale? It's going to be folks with cash on hand. Where's a great place to keep your cash? One of these modernized whole life policies, in my opinion. Yeah, Mark. Well, it kind of reminds me of this saying by Keith Weinhold, and it says, do things right and then do the right things. Or maybe it's vice versa. But either way, <laughs> real estate <laughs> investors are out there doing the right things. You know, they're building wealth, uh, you know, building passive streams of income through cash flowing real estate, trying to invest in sound, stable, sustainable, growing markets 
with, you know, great job growth and population migration and things of that nature. So they're doing the right things by building this wealth, achieving financial freedom, and ultimately engineering a lifestyle that they want. Now, looking further down that road, there's some things that people can do a little better and start to do right things. So that's kind of where you come into play and you kind of help people, you know, engineer this this uh, financial picture that they want themselves to be in. Now, you know, you really help your clients out by coming up with some of these, what I'm kind of considering obscure, you know, whole life insurance, you know, policies mm-hmm. and things like that. So it's really important to be working with a sound uh, financial advisor and more importantly, a certified financial planner. So can you tell us a little bit about what to look for for those people who are looking for you know, some advice from people like yourself? You want to find somebody who has gone through the rigors uh, of uh, additional certifications beyond just getting a, a license or whatnot. You want to have someone with some extra credentials. Maybe they're authorized in this particular strategy of becoming your own banker. Bank on yourself, authorized advisors are one place. Certified financial planners are another. If you can find someone who has either of those strategies uh, behind their name, you know that they're qualified. You know that they've, they've, they know what they're talking about. They didn't just Google this 15 minutes before you walked in the door uh, to their office. <laughs> you want to sit down with you and, and do a high level overview of your entire financial life, not just run you a quote. You know, you want someone who uh, understands you, uh, someone that gets your goal with real estate. Different people have different needs. Some folks, it's uh, it's about equity. Some people, it's about fix and flip. Some people, it's about uh, that generating that income. You really want somebody who sort of understands your long-term strategy and also can engineer the right solution for you. Uh, and someone who's willing to say, here's exactly what I'm going to get paid in, as a result. And are you accept, you know, is that an acceptable amount? And here's what the costs are. Here's what the benefits are and are those acceptable to you? So asking, being upfront and frank uh, with your advisor uh, is really key. Yeah. And Mark, could you touch on just really quickly what a fiduciary res- responsibility means to the client? Absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's both clear and not clear, unfortunately. I mean, even Bernie Madoff uh, was a fiduciary. So I didn't realize that. Uh, it, yeah. It's a, it's a term that I think is so important. Uh, what it means is that you must act in the best interest of your clients. Now, doesn't that sound awesome? Like, isn't that just like a no brainer? Uh, the trouble is people are people are people. Uh, so folks can be a fiduciary and still be, you know, crooked like, like he was. Uh, so you really need to first ask the question, are you acting in my best interest? Are you a fiduciary? Uh, but more importantly than any name tag or title, Really get to understand the person. Do you trust that advisor sitting across the table from you? Uh, because regardless, um, you have to hold them to your standards, not just uh, the fiduciary standard. Yeah, really good point there. And I didn't realize that, you know, just not trusting that label of fiduciary, you know, I kind of took that to mean what I think it means. But I guess in all reality, mm-hmm. like you said, people are people. So yeah, really good point there. And, you know, just making sure your visions and goals align with, you know, that of your yeah. financial planner is probably the most important there. And uh, anyone that uh, works in our firm is acting in that standard. So, um, you know, we certainly want to make sure that you, that you know that anyone who works with us knows that we are obligated to work as, in the client's best interest. Uh, and that's, that's a uh, standard that I'm proud to, to hold. I think what else could we possibly want for our clients? Yeah. It all works out in the end. I mean, if, if our clients are thrilled with the work we've done for them, uh, our bills get paid and we enjoy a good life here at Lake Growth. But, uh, you know, we first and foremost have to make sure that their needs are ahead of our own. Yeah, 100%. yeah, really good points, Mark. Well, Mark, as we're wrapping up here, we've got a lightning around that we pose to every guest here on the show. And we'd like to just shoot about five questions at you and you just answer from the hip. How does that sound? Sweet. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Well, the first question was, what was your biggest hurdle getting started in this industry and how did you overcome it? My own mindset. I think the, uh, the, the world really tells us what we, what they think we should know about how money works, whether it's, you know, putting all your money in a 401k and just, you know, hoping and praying that it all works. Uh out. I mean, hope and pray is not a strategy. So (laughs) that's, that's, that's my lightning round answer. Um, change your mind. The fish is the last to know it's wet. <laughs> I like it. Another great analogy. 
Well, Mark, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? Uh, I think, you know, if you can choose health uh, every day, whether it's going to the gym or taking a walk or just doing some stretching, it, it just helps you know that you're at least in control of your decisions to be healthy. Whatever your body can do, I think, give it a shot. Uh, you'll be amazed at how you can grow. Uh, in all areas of life, when you can just make a decision to be better today with your health than you were yesterday. Yeah, great. I love it. Well, Mark, do you have an online resource that you find valuable? Online resource. Audible has been my uh, favorite lately. Um, I've thankfully been able to read about a book or two a month, and uh, that's only because I'm able to do it while I'm doing my dishes and cleaning the house and all the other family stuff that we do. Uh, Audible. Com. Yeah, and that brings up a couple good points for the members listening that don't already have an Audible subscription. I'll drop a link in the show notes and you can go and get a free subscription to Audible for a month and it comes with a free audio book. And tying into the next question, Mark, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? There's a, Speaking of the topic that we just looked at, uh, I would absolutely highly recommend you read the book, The Bank on Yourself Revolution, uh, New York Times bestselling book by Pamela Yellen. The Bank on Yourself Revolution. Okay. No no relation to Janet Yellen, I assume? Yeah, I guess not. No. And in fact, there's a chapter in there, I think, on real estate. So um, find that book. Find a way. Uh, yeah, chapter seven. So uh, check that book out. And if you guys don't have a copy of it, feel free to give me a shout. Okay, great. We'll link that book in the show notes. Thanks so much for that. And then last question, Mark. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started in this industry, what would it be? Uh, learn to think like a banker. Um, go beyond renter. Go beyond homeowner. Go beyond real estate investor. Become the mortgage company to everybody else. Go upstream financially. Yeah, I love it. Good stuff. Well, Mark, it's been a unique conversation. So many good points. Lots of new stuff for the audience. You know, this is a lot of stuff that we don't always get when we're into the weeds of real estate investing and management company this and, you know, leases that, you know, all these complex, you know, financing strategies. It's really good to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And I think you've opened our eyes to a lot of that. So we really thank you for that. I'm sure our audience is going to want to know more about what you do, how to find you. So where can our listeners go if they want to keep up with all that you're doing and sharing out there? Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, we'd love to connect and hear more about your strategies with your real estate, what your goals are. Uh, two places. Uh, one, go to notyouraveragefinancialpodcast.com. That's where we're posting new episodes. Uh, and uh, notyouraveragefinancialpodcast.com. And then if you'd like a free financial review consultation with me or my advisors here in our firm, uh, we're offering this to the audience uh, of your real estate podcast, Jacob, and be very happy to speak with them. Uh, so anyone who's listening to this can go to lakegrowth.com. That's L-A-K-E-G-R-O-W-T-H.com forward slash schedule. You can schedule a quick 10-minute meeting with one of our advisors. We can see if we're a good fit for each other. And uh, if you do that and mention the mention Jacob's podcast, The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, uh, in your, um, you know, your, your sign up on our booking appointment calendar, and we'll be sure to send a, uh, one of our best selling books, uh, from, uh, with compliments of Jacob. So, uh, thank you guys. Well, Mark, thank you so much for that. And I'm sure it's going to be a such value to our audience. So to recap that, if they want to find you, we can go to not your average financial podcast.com. You also co-host a podcast called not your average financial podcast, which is great. My, my dimension, lots of different information in there. You also have quite a few video series on YouTube and then lategrowth.com slash schedule. If you want to reach out to Mark, just call for a 10 or 15 minute consultation. Mark's happy to run through any kind of financial advice, real estate deals, any kind of advice he can provide value to you. He's happy to do that. And he's also going to give you a free copy of their best selling book. So Mark, thank you for that. We really value it. We really value you coming on the show today and all you've shared with us. Well, it's my pleasure, Jacob. Yeah, I'd be very pleased to do it again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mark, till next time, thanks so much for coming on the show. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. 
The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom LLC exclusively.